It's my pleasure to introduce four individuals who will be telling us about a management technique, prescribed burning. I'll introduce all four of them and then they'll pass the baton from one to the other. We'll be leading off with Dave Apsley. Dave has been a forester and a natural resources specialist with the Ohio State University Extension since 2000. He'll be discussing the role of fire in Oaks, Ohio's oak dominated woodlands and the efforts of the Ohio Interagency Forestry Team. He is a part of our Ohio Tree Farm Committee and we certainly appreciate his efforts there. Jim Savage, whose land we'll be seeing here and be talking about, is a mostly retired attorney who has practiced as a civil trial lawyer in Columbus for 38 years. He grew up in Chillicothe, graduated from Duke University and obtained his law degree from Washington University, St. Louis. He now spends most of his time managing his farm, family's ATFS certified tree farm, which straddles the Ross Vinton County lines. He'll be speaking on prescribed burning of woodlands from his perspective as a landowner. Jim is also an active part of our Ohio Tree Farm Committee. Alex Kendler is a certified forester and owner of Kendler Forest Management LLC since 2009. He is a graduate of, Ohio, of Hocking College and the Ohio State University's forestry programs. He'll be discussing the oak shelterwood timber harvest and controlled burn recommendation for the Savage Tree Farm Oak Regeneration Project. Both Alex and his wife have been a part of our tree farm uh, committee in the past and we certainly appreciate their involvement. Last but certainly not least, we have Tim Mason. Tim is a retired natural resources manager and certified prescribed fire manager. He'll be discussing conditions necessary to conduct a prescribed fire. Dave, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Tom. Um, I see Jim on and Alex and Tim, you guys can go ahead and turn your cameras on. Uh, are you folks seeing the PowerPoint slide? Mm. Give me a thumbs up, okay. So again, we're gonna talk about prescribed fire as a new tool for Ohio woodland owners. And we've got a question mark by that because Jim has a few comments on, on that as we go, but it is a new tool and, and Jim's kind of a guinea pig because he's the first woodland owner that I'm aware of that actually did a prescribed burn in a woodland setting to uh, encourage oak regeneration in Ohio. So I wanna start out with just a little background about why we might use fire. And some of you may have already seen these slides, so I'll get through them quickly and we'll get to the meat. Uh, but I wanted to, to discuss why oaks are important briefly. Katie already mentioned the White Oak Initiative and the importance of White Oak for barrels. Um, I actually just joined the steering committee for the White Oak Initiative. But oaks live for a long time, and you'll sometimes and oftentimes the oldest trees in your woods are white oaks. They provide great habitat for a variety of wildlife species, and they contribute greatly to our economy, the forest products industry. Um, about 67% of the trees harvested in Ohio are oaks. But when you look at the trends, this is a comparison of the canopy and it's just comparing oak to maple. And in most cases, we're talking about red maple. So about half of the trees in the canopy in these oak dominated woods are oak or maple. And 70% of that half is oak currently. The other 30% or 30 of that half is maple. But when you start looking at the smaller trees, you're seeing more maple and less oak. And the trends are really pretty alarming. So if we don't change our management and include practices like prescribed fire and proper cutting, uh, we're converting our woods to red maple in this part of the, of the state, especially. So why is this happening? Uh, we don't have fire in the woods anymore, uh, thanks to Smoky Bear and a lot of efforts of the Division of Forestry and others. Um, fire is less frequent and fire is not always a good thing. It's not always a bad thing, but when it's uncontrolled, it can be a problem. I truly believe some of the past land use uh, things that happen like grazing and other disturbances probably favored oak. They are really a disturbance oriented species and some of those disturbances have gone away as well. But part of it is our timber harvesting practices. We're currently, we've almost got a bounty on oaks. When we do a harvest in the woods, we're taking oaks out of the canopy because they have value. And a lot of times we're leaving lower quality species out in the woods. And if we don't uh, manage those harvests right, we don't have enough light to the forest floor to get oak to regenerate. Oak is really a species, the oak as a genus, most of them are fire adapted 
They have relatively thick bark, so they can withstand fire as long as it's not really intense fire. They have the ability to, if they get damaged by fire, they can isolate that damage and wall it off and the decay doesn't spread quickly, especially in white oak. And then the strategy that we're gonna talk about really and what we're trying to take advantage of with the burn on the Savage property is oaks have a tendency to hang out in the understory if they get an intermediate amount of light and they put their energy into the root system. And they're building this big root system and their top is usually pretty small. If a fire comes through, it knocks the top back, but then they got this big root reserve where they can sprout and be very competitive. And then the oak woods, as you'll see when we do a little video later, they're designed to burn. The leaves will burn, they stay crunchy and they'll, they'll burn and we'll show that in a little bit. So in a nutshell, if we want oak back, cutting and praying rarely works. Some of you may have heard me talk about this, but the first time I used this slide, there was a Franciscan monk in the back of the, of the room. <laughs> staring me down and I'm a I'm a cradle Catholic so it was a little uncomfortable but you've got a plan for oak regeneration you got a plan to manage those seedlings that are on the ground before and after acorn crops ideally uh, you need to use treatments that give those oak seedlings an advantage and oftentimes that's removing that midstory or partial overstory of the or removal of the overstory which is what we're going to talk about in this case and then once the oaks get competitive, we would remove the remainder of the canopy and we'd have a new oak dominated woods. Um, if folks wanna learn more about this and our Ohio interagency forestry efforts, there is a great um, edition of the Woodland Journal and I'm trying to look, volume 27, number one, it's the winter edition of 2020. Um, we go quite a bit into oak management in that book or in that article. And you'll also notice my PowerPoint slides here have um, several agencies listed. There's an Ohio interagency forestry team with the focus on managing oak in Southeast Ohio. So that's part of our efforts here in Southeast Ohio. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Alex, or I'm sorry, to Jim. And Jim, if you need me or Alex to advance the slides, just let us know. Okay. Uh, I I think I can probably deal with this slide first and then pass it on to Alex. Uh, he's the technical guru, so I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's an uh, interesting uh, day, I think, for all of us. Uh, I'm going to literally fly above the trees for a second and kind of give everyone an overview of what we've been doing, and, and then that will lead into Alex's uh, analysis of uh, the, the oak uh, shelter wood burn that we did. So uh, <clears throat> our farm straddles the uh, Ross County, Benton County line. Uh, the first section my parents got in 1990, I'm sorry, in 1987. Um, I grew up in Chillicothe and we used it for recreation growing up and things. And uh, uh, my, my father uh, sort of managed the property, sort of didn't. Um, somehow we became certified in 1986. Uh, my parents passed away in 2003, 2004. I was determined to be a good steward of the land, bought out my sister, and I had an even-aged forest uh, that had been high-graded twice in the previous 40 years. And, uh, you know, it really wasn't in very good shape. Uh, the first thing I did is I got hooked up with uh, Mark Rickey, uh, the private man land management forester assigned to our counties. And I can't tell you what a wonderful um, and informative partner he's been. He's absolutely one of the significant reasons why our farm has uh, progressed as far as it has. Had great insights, got me started in the right direction, doing some TSI, getting rid of some Atlantis, et cetera. And uh, around 2012, after eight years or so, it's like, hey, dude, <laughs> you need to get a consulting forester um, and take it to the next level. And I had met the Kindlers uh, by doing some, they were doing some TSI work for me. And I was impressed uh, by them and their ability uh, uh, to do a, a proposal to do a data driven management plan where what was there could be inventoried and we would use that to back in to what we needed to do as opposed to walking around and saying, oh, it'd be nice to do this, it'd be nice to do that. 
So, uh, and, and again, or not again, but for, for people that haven't done it, keep in mind um, the number one priority pay item on EQIP is for a management plan. And uh, I looked at the pay items as of a few months ago, and they're more than adequate to uh, get you, to, to help you finance uh, a, a inventory-based, data-driven management plan. And I couldn't recommend uh, you doing that more. So uh, Alex, I'll let you take it from there on what we did. Uh, starting in two, or 2012, 2013, our, our management plan, how that led us to Oak, uh, prescribed burn. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, am I showing up on there? Okay. You are. So, um, you know, a lot of what Jim was saying about the history of the property and the cutting that had taken place and then the efforts that he was wanting to make to improve the woodland um, uh, and then the subsequent forest management plan and his desire to have what he said, a data-driven forest management plan. As a forester, you really jump at a chance to help a landowner like that because it gives you the opportunity to use all of your skill set to help that landowner. And um, so I really have enjoyed working with him over the years and hope to continue to do so, obviously. And uh, it turned out in some pretty cool projects that were really really fun to organize and then put together and then see them through fruition. Uh, and uh, they're ongoing, obviously. But um, at the time, he wanted to have the forest management plan uh, really focus on creating early successional habitat and meet the habitat requirements for rough grouse. So, um, you know, we were looking at, we knew already we were looking at trying to create that young forest habitat, high stem density forest that they needed to thrive, to be protected from avian predators. But in the Appalachian region, they're also highly dependent on oak and mass production. So uh, along with many other species in our region that we need to protect the oaks. And um, he also had an interest in uh, regenerating oak where possible, given what Dave had explained earlier about the red maple and the poplar, the conversion from our oak forests over to more mesic uh, species. Um, those problems were identified to the extent that we could, and uh, wherever possible, uh, we were trying to regenerate oak with a couple different methods, but really going to talk about one today, um, and uh, what ultimately led to what we'll call the shelter wood burn method being applied, and I'll talk a little bit about why we recommended that, um, some of the inventory data we collected, and recommendations that came along with that, and um, maybe in the end, you can glean a little bit of information that will tell, help you understand. It's not appropriate for every stand, but there's a lot of certain conditions you can identify that would say, yes, there's a, there's a, a lot of really good things about this particular stand that says uh, what would lead us towards oak management techniques to try to regenerate an oak forest again. So um, essentially, I'll start to see if I'll, I can work this thing here. Okay, I clicked and it didn't advance. So I'll have you do it, Dave. Uh, okay. So you can advance me to the next slide and I'll, I'll show a little bit about the inventory method. Okay, so we already knew we had some issues with the boundary layer at the property. Uh, Jim was aware of some issues with the layers on the maps that were incorrect from um, uh, what was actually on the ground. So he had us go around and actually use a GPS and correct some corners. So we corrected the boundary lines and then we used GIS to layer a plot grid uh, over the forest. And uh, with the eventual intention of collecting inventory data and then analyzing it so that we could make these data-driven recommendations with inventory information and science to, to help him manage the forest at a higher level. Um, so in the end, we had these uh, this plot grid, about one plot per four acres is what it turned out to be. And um, it's, it was 114 sample plots that we took. And more specifically, they weren't plots, they were actually point samples. We use a 10 factor uh, basal area factor prism and it's a variable radius sample system. So it depends on the size of the tree as to whether or not we'll sample it. And I, I believe the average basal area on the farm was around 90 square feet of basal area. So for every single point that we took, there were around nine trees measured and we would measure those trees for species 
determine the species, measure the diameter, measure the merchantable product, and then we would assign uh, a status to each tree of acceptable growing stock or unacceptable growing stock. And there were some rules as to pertaining to whether a tree could be considered an ag, AGS, ags or ugs, uh, unacceptable growing stock. And um, to be considered an ag, the tree needs to be able to survive for at least 15 years, uh, be of a commercial species, of desirable uh, species, and uh, have a potential to produce at least a grade three saw log. So it needs to be a fairly good tree uh, in good health in order to be considered a, an acceptable growing stock tree. So um, the overall intention in the end with that is that we would then use that data, uh, combine it into different stands based on what we would find during, we would take notes when we traverse the land and, uh, and then we developed a, a stand map, which was shown on that first slide and we'll see it again. But uh, here on the right, basically what we've got here is that uh, there's the yellow lines and those yellow lines and numbers all correspond to uh, the forest stand. And then that information was all compiled and then run through Silva. And then the Silva program was a forest service program was then um, used to uh, give us some, some hard facts and some numbers about the trees on that particular hillside. And um, so we then, after we ran all those individual plots as combined into stands through Silva, we labeled each stand on the left, you'll see a chart that says stand A, B, C, et cetera. And, um, and each of those stands, then we'd have inventory data for that. So you could see the number of acres was calculated in GIS. You have average diameter, trees per acre, and then the RD and AGS RD relates to a measurement that Silva uses called relative density. And um, the relative density is a, a measure then that we can look at determining the density of that forest. And um, uh, we'll also be able to calculate the forest type, size, class along with that. Um, but uh, the relative density is kind of key in a couple ways and we used it to, to help us decide what to do on this farm because the, and the, what I like to do with relative density is actually several classes that Silva doesn't use this lettering code, but I like to use it because I feel like it's easier. I'll give a brief explanation of what it is. The stand, so density class A, for example, is a very overstocked forest. It's over 100% relative density. So there's a couple stands. It could be a young stand or it could be an old stand. Uh, it's just a measure of, of how many trees are present on that stand relative to an average stand of maximum potential. So anything you have over 100%, it's, it's well over what it should be. So that's a priority for us to note that, that any A stand probably needs the management and needs it fast. Stand, the B class would be over the, the optimum range, but under that 100% figure. Uh, so it's not as high a priority, but it's the next priority. Uh, C would be within the range of best optimal uh, range of, uh, of growth for best optimal growth. And then you have a D class, which there were none on this farm. And then it starts to bring in the AGS uh, component. So um, a D stand would actually be under the, the range for best individual growth, but over 35% acceptable growing stock. An E stand is under uh, the best individual range for, for growth. So there's not enough trees on that stand to occupy it, but there's also not enough good quality trees. So there's under 35% acceptable growing stock. So essentially this chart here will show the A stands are a priority and E stands are a priority. And in this example, we're talking about creating regeneration harvest to create early successional habitat. So those are opportunities for us to create some of that habitat, either increase mass production or increase the young forest habitat. Um, so I think we can go to the next slide here. So stand N, um, was it a good candidate for management, oak management? How do we know whether a stand is a good candidate for oak management? There's the third line down or so on this chart where it says forest type, size, class, density, class on the right-hand side. It says mixed oak, large saw timber, density class A. So those three figures right there will tell us it could be a good candidate for oak management and it's probably time to regenerate. Um, the size class I haven't talked about much yet. 
is determined by measuring all trees two inches and larger, which is what we did as part of the inventory. So when um, they assign different size classes to a forest based on the average diameter of all trees two inches and larger. So this stand had an average diameter of 19.4 inches, even considering trees all the way down to two inches. So it was a very mature stand. And they consider a stand to be considered a large saw timber class stand as long as it's over 16 and a half inches in diameter. So we were well above the, uh, the large saw timber category. Uh, we also look at you know, the trees breaker, the basal area and the relative density. We were 140% relative density in this stand. So it was very overcrowded. And um, the other really great thing that makes this a good candidate for oak management is that it had not had a prior harvest. This is a one area where maybe for aesthetic reasons, they had never harvested and Jim, maybe you can speak to that, why this area was not uh, harvested before, but um, it, it had a lot of mature trees. Yeah, it's uh, what you can see from the, the lake and the house. So <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, my father wanted to cut it in 1993 and I absolutely begged him uh, to exclude that from the harvest. And, uh, you know, Usually he didn't listen to what I had to say, but he did on that one. <laughs> well, we're lucky that that happened because now if that had been cut, this is a thing that this is a problem that I see a lot with oak stands because as Dave said before, they kind of have a bounty on them. They're very valuable. You go in and you do selective type of cutting and you start to just pick around a little bit here or there. But what you're really doing is removing some very dominant trees, letting in light, and then probably not managing at that point and on. And so you get this large pole timber to develop uh, and holes in the crown, and you get uh, a lot of other problems that you have to address when you're trying to then convert it to uh, this state that we would prefer to have it in for a shelter would burn method to be appropriate. So ultimately, you know, it was a good decision not to uh, harvest those trees and there was a lot of really high quality white oak in that stand. Um, uh, we were able to find that there was about 13,000 board feet an acre. I wanted to also mention that a lot of people will look at uh, how mature a stand is based on that figure too. Um, so uh, with the landowner's objectives in mind to regenerate oak to create early successional uh, habitat and the state of this particular oak stand, we recommended that a shelter would be implemented and um, we calculated that we should reduce the base area to around 45 or 50 square feet per acre and to remove about 8,100 board feet per acre um, out of that stand to get it into what will eventually be a two age forest that we could, we could manage that understory uh, with potentially different methods, um, including possibly fire. So let's go ahead on to some pictures here Oh, okay, I guess I got the, uh, the harvest here. Okay, so uh, this comes to the actual harvest layout. I wanted to go over this too. So it's cutting section three in the center screen is the five acres that we had to deal with that was undisturbed. The other blue highlighted areas or part of the other uh, grouse management objectives, we implemented some deferment cuts and some group selection harvests. Um, but uh, Cutting section three is uh, the five acres or so that was this nice white oak stand. So actually how we did that was uh, to, uh, we, we GPSed our way around the boundary and we painted the boundary line. And then we went through the stand and we marked trees to leave. This is a, a kind of technical forestry uh, method, but a lot of times landowners will see you mark the trees to cut. In this instance, there's way more trees that are going to be cut then are going to be left. So the method would be to mark the leave trees with paint and then all other trees would be removed from that stand. So trees two inches and larger needed to be removed aside from the trees we wanted to retain. Well, what kind of trees would we want to retain? We wanted to retain good, healthy trees that could be potential seed producers. They have good uh, stem quality. They don't exhibit many of the characteristics that can be a negative feature found in white oak like epicormic branching or excessive branching down the main stem. Um, so the hope is that they'll be uh, less likely to develop those features once they're opened up and exposed. Um, you don't want to uh, retain 
trees that really have the potential to be veneer quality because of that risk. Um, and so uh, there's kind of a fine line between you don't need to retain trees of extreme high quality, but you need to retain trees of acceptable quality so that they'll regener help regenerate that stand and give us the objectives we want and maintain forest health. Um, so uh, ultimately we reduced the basal area in there from 150 square feet per acre down to 50. And um, uh, we removed 8,800 board feet per acre and it was mostly in the species listed there at the bottom, white oak, black oak, beech, and maple. And we're gonna try to definitely retain white oak in particular but as, as needed to retain that density, hickory and other oak species like red oak, scarlet oak, black oak, uh, that might've been in that forest too. But definitely we wanna retain the white oak. And one of the factors around that is that they tend to have cluster seeding. So when they release their acorn crop, uh, they regenerate fairly quickly in the, in the winter before wildlife has a chance to move the acorns around and so you will get clusters of seed developing around seed trees. So um, it's better, and especially a target species, we're having a lot of challenges with to retain the white oak as opposed to some of the other oak species. Okay, I think we can head on to pictures then of the harvest. So at first, it kind of looks like a park. What do you think, Jim? I mean, I remember you saying that. Looks like a park. Yep. <laughs> And, uh, but I knew eventually it was not going to look like a park. It doesn't look like a park now. It's going to look like a thick mess in there. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, one reason, you know, not every landowner likes to necessarily do this to their forest, but it's a fairly extreme cutting, but it's necessary. Oak really needs to have this, these types of disturbances in order to have success in regenerating among many of the things Dave mentioned earlier too, like mid-story removals that need to occur, you know, to, to develop an uh, understory layer of oak seedlings. We didn't have that here. We chose to move forward. We knew that eventually we would have to address that regeneration layer and whether it be through a combination of fire, herbicide or interplanting, we're gonna get oak back on this site no matter what we decided that was gonna happen. So, um, and yeah, I think there's a couple more pictures we can see here, you can advance. And you can maybe see the, uh, the blue mark on that tree in the center. This is a really good example of a good leaf tree for a shelter wood. And that blue mark meant, was meant to read uh, that it was a retained tree. And then they were cutting everything else. And, and I wanna thank also Superior Hardwoods who wound up purchasing this track and uh, Brian Feigt, was uh, the timber buyer and for forester on the ground for Superior. And he was really, it was a lot of uh, uh, pleasure to work with him. So through this whole process and he helped make sure that it actually went well. And, um, and so this is actually in the fall, uh, they logged it first, Strickland and Sons had, had done the harvest and they removed most of the pulpwood out of the stand. And then another log, came in, which I can't remember, I didn't have it written down, who actually harvested the more valuable timber in, this in the fall. And then, um, and then the harvest was completed. Um, let's see, I think we can move on to other pictures. Okay, yeah, so we're here at the regen regeneration inventory. So Jim, do you wanna talk about anything that you did leading up to this point? Yeah, so uh, 2017 spring, fast forward, we're two and a half years. And there's a bunch of green stuff in there. And my question is, um, are, we getting the, are we getting the regeneration of seedlings that we hope for? And uh, so I asked uh, Alex and Abby to come back and do a regeneration inventory uh, just to confirm, or at least to find out, uh, you know, what, what that mess uh, consisted of. And this is the results of it on this particular stand. We were also did it on the other stands that were cut uh, because I wanted to know if we were getting enough seedlings as opposed to invasives. Um, but that's a, another story for another day. So Alex, uh, tell us the results of the regeneration inventory on this uh, particular stand. Okay, thanks, Jim. And yep, yeah, that's right. Again, remember I said that he was a very data-driven landowner. He wanted to see what was happening out there. He contacted us two years later and said, hey, let's go do a regeneration inventory. I want to make sure I've got an acceptable number of trees coming back. 
So I, I designed a, uh, with the help of Abby, designed a, uh, a regeneration inventory. And we went around and we took six foot radius plot sample, all of the harvest areas, including stand N, which was the shelterwood stand. And in, here's the results of the stand end inventory. Um, um, for the seedlings, the size they were after two years, we wanted to have at least 3000 stems per acre. We had 7,200. So we had plenty of regeneration um, and we were able to find that we also had a nice amount of oak seedlings mixed in, 1,125 uh, in total with the highlighted white oak uh, being WO. There were 600 uh, seedlings per acre, black oak 450, and then CO is chestnut oak. There were 75 on average per acre in there. Uh, the other species, OHW is other hardwoods. There's several species lumped in there like sassafras, sycamore, and things like that. Um, and then you see YP, that's yellow poplar. There's well more yellow poplar than pretty much any other species in there. And then you had ash and red maple and beech, cherry, so sugar maple. There's a lot of competition that we found that was present there, which was to be expected. Fortunately, the, one of the benefits of a shelter wood method is that retaining some of those overstory trees actually slows the height growth of those competing species. So we're helping the oak it, by leaving some of those uh, seed trees or shelter trees um, over a clear cut, we're reducing the height by about 40% each year. So um, we're helping the oak compete, but they put all their energy into the root system and not the shoot. So um, we knew that oh, continued time, if nothing was done, they would be overtopped and outcompeted. So we recognized at that point in time that um, a prescribed burn would be ideal herbicide work to reduce the competing species around the oaks uh, would be needed uh, within a few years to help those oaks maintain a little bit of competitiveness. So next slide. Uh, here's another illustration just showing how, how much of the competing species were versus the oak uh, highlighted in, in yellow. Which, what's OHW again? That's what I, I term other hardwood. So that would okay. be for other hardwood. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And this is what it looked like the, uh, the year of the inventory. So this is in, I think it was May of 2017. So we have a couple growing seasons uh, afterwards. This is one of the deferment harvests um, that we did. And, and so you can see some of the, cluster, the tight clusters you can see are probably stump sprouts. And then there's a lot of brambles and new seedlings being established in this poplar stand. And uh, we can move on to this picture here. Uh, this is a photo. I go ahead and move to the 2021. Next one. Okay. Yep, I'm seeing the 2020. This isn't the actual stand, so. Well, now I'm seeing the next slide. But either way. I'm Which not, one do you want? How about uh, that? Next, next, next slide, the May 220. Yeah, this is the May 2020 Shelterwood picture. Oh, okay. Well, I'm out of order. Sorry. Oh, shoot. Hey, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what everybody's seeing, but I'm seeing a shelterwood picture. Um, it was taken in May of 2020 by, by Jim. And it, so this is now we're five growing seasons after the harvest. And this is the year we knew the burn was going to happen. We had hoped it was going to be in the spring, but it wound up happening in the fall um, due to COVID and other concerns, I believe, and so. Yeah, and I'll add that uh, if you, a few years before that, um, it was announced that Equip was gonna have a new item for prescribed burns for private woodland owners. And uh, a lot of what I was doing the two or three years before 2020 was kind of asking you know, what that was going to be and when it was going to be implemented. And it was an extremely long process uh, by DNR to kind of figure out what they wanted to do to get the, get it onto equip and, you know, who could do it and how they need to be licensed and this, that, and the other. And it really wasn't until 2019, uh, you know, which is, already four years after the harvest when it was actually an option. And we were looking to do it in the, in the spring of 2020 and 
had already started doing our um, fire breaks and uh, <clears throat> and then the COVID hit. And so obviously we, we, you know, we had to defer that, but go ahead, Alex. So the picture here that I'm seeing on the right is 2020 and beyond slide um, is what it looked like November 7th, 2020. So in the foreground, you see a little red leaf. That's a little red oak or a black oak. And then I had the photo down probably about near my thigh or so, and I was angling it up and you could really see how much taller the poplar are in the background uh, than the oak seedlings. So they're putting all their energy into their shoots and we have the oaks that are much shorter and being suppressed. So uh, this is pretty much what I had feared would happen and uh, we knew would happen. So here's the day of the burn and um, after the, I just wanted to say basically a couple more things. And um, after the burn uh, occurred, I know we'll have to come back probably in the next year or two and study the regeneration and then um, see how well the burn result was. And it might require some additional herbicide work or more burning. And we'll need to probably continue to stockpile that oak regeneration over time and make sure that we get some free to grow oak. And, um, and some research that I've read on it, wants to have at least 100 to 150 um, oaks free to grow by the end of this process so that we'll know that we have enough oak uh, in that stand to replace the overstory. So with that, Jim, I'll hand it over to you to maybe talk more about Equip and, and introduce Tim and what you went yeah. through the process. And we're down to 25 minutes left, so. Yeah, anecdotally, I'll say that, uh, you know, just from observation, right before we did the burn in November, I know you had identified in the regen study three years earlier that uh, uh, poplar and other were the largest percent. It seemed to me like there were, we had more beech trees that were impacted than anything else because they just were spreading out so much. Uh, but in any event, um, uh, able to find a great contractor in Tim Mason, um, whose company uh, does prescribed burning um, Probably the, most of their work is grasslands around the state. Um, I converted my pasture to 100% pollinator a few years back and Tim did the prescribed burn. So I knew him and uh, he, but he's the expert on this. So I'm gonna pass the ball over to him and let him explain to you uh, what it is in a burn. It's a, it's a quite an interesting scientific, uh, little, some science, some art, a little bit of both, right, Tim? A little bit of both. So uh, thank, thank you for that. And the, the prescribed fire is a, a very valuable tool that we have for landowners. Um, we, it, it can save a lot of time and, and money as far as what we're trying to, to do as far as management goes. As the name suggests, it is done with a prescription. Uh, and prescribed fire, we we look at, at the symptoms, we look at the, the fuels, and we make sure that we are uh, we're writing a prescription that fits that particular site. Uh, anybody who's done any prescribed fire is familiar with the, the fire triangle you see there. Uh, we've got fuel, we've got air, and we've got heat. And the, the fuel we can look at in this particular case, uh, we were dealing with um, leaves, uh, small twigs, uh, the heat source. And again, in a prescribed fire situation, we're using drip torch, uh, a mixture of um, diesel and gasoline. Uh, the, the biggest factor in, in a prescribed fire is the air and how we manage um, how we manage that, and, and that's uh, an unknown variable. Uh, you know, we can look at the forecast, and, and we hope that the, the uh, folks are correct in that. So I looked at the site, and we put together a burn plan, and the burn plan includes what the landowner's objectives are, and can we meet those objectives with fire. Again, we look at the fuel type, how much fuel is there, uh, what, what the fuel load is, uh, we're going to look at uh, the slope, the aspect, um, the size of the site, access to the site. And it's not just access for a fire crew, uh, but we have to plan on access. If something goes wrong, can we get uh, a, a larger crew if, if we have to call for backup support there? 
we need to look at, at fire lines, fire breaks, and then write contingency <clears throat> plans in there. So uh, the, the first thing we had to do after we, we made the determination we could do that is we started to work on some of the breaks. Uh, Jim had a logging road in there uh, in that site. And so we could go in and, and working off of that, we removed all the down trees. Uh, we had to look at snags, make sure that, that we didn't have any snags close to the line. We typically work about a chain in. And so we, we determined what resources we're gonna need to do that. And the biggest factor then to figure is smoke management. So where does that smoke go once it leaves the site? Uh, and, and as you can imagine, there is quite a bit of smoke in there and you're, you're responsible for that when it leaves. Uh, is it gonna go to a, another community? Um, what, what's downwind from that smoke? So those are all things that go into to a plan prior to writing uh, the, the uh, plan. So spring 2020, we did go in and start working on the line. Uh, we made the determination, as the slide shows here, that it would be more economical for Jim to bring a, a dozer in than for us to continue cutting the line. What we're seeing here, it's clear enough, we, we could have scraped a line in there, but when you see from the next slide, uh, you're going to realize that there's a lot of little brush in there. If we were to cut all of that out, it would have taken a lot more time, being a little more expensive. But we also would have had some, some stump, small stumps there that could be tripping hazards. So one of the things we have to look at in a fire is the safety of our, our fire crew. Um, we, we go, there we go. So, so the dozer did an excellent job, did in probably two or three hours what it would have taken us uh, eight to 12 hours. And this is what we're looking for, a nice mineral earth uh, break Fire can't cross that line, um, you know, by spreading unless you get wind that, that uh, jumps that. And so uh, burning from a break like this, we're, we're kind of, uh, we, we take the, the Bob, Bob Seeger against the wind. We're burning against the wind. Uh, this is on the upslope and we're going to burn downhill. Again, going back to that fire triangle, um, remember that, that the, the air factor. Uh, fire can create its own air just as a, a, your wood stove or your candle has to have that air to burn, fire's gonna have to do that as well. And so those, we're gonna burn against the, uh, the, the slope and against the wind. In the valley that you saw uh, on Jim's slide, it's really difficult to uh, determine what the wind was gonna do. We knew we didn't want a, west, a direct west wind, but the, the wind's gonna funnel down that valley and it was gonna make it difficult to, uh, to, to accurately manage that wind. So um, let's see, what, where are we here? I can, uh, I got these a little bit out of order. You want me to just start, start the video and kind of explain? Yeah, why don't you, in light yeah, of the why don't time. we, why don't we yeah. do that? And you can just talk over it. Correct. We'll, we'll, we'll hear a little bit too as we go, but let's just do that. Let me know, give me a thumbs up if you start seeing it playing here in a second. I want to put it on the line and it'll get a nice smoky. <laughs> so we do a briefing. Uh, we're we're going to let everybody know what's happening on the on the fire. At this point, I'm taking weather. We have to take uh, weather measurements, measurements before and after. Uh, we cleaned up the line. This is our test fire. And as you uh, uh, look there, as I'm fumbling for my phone, you wonder, and this guy's in charge? That's what happens when you put a Luddite in charge. But we, I we have a... The, we have uh, a we have a crew dominated by senior citizens. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so I, I contact dispatch ahead of time, let them know that we're going to do this. And then I will call back when we have fire on the ground. Uh, we let them know again a day before, uh, an hour or two before the fire and let them know when it's when we actually have fire on the ground. This is a test fire. What we're doing here is see what this fire is going to do, how's it going to react, and that's going to determine which way we're going to work on our line. Uh, so the drip torch that uh, that you see Ron carrying there, that has a the diesel gas mixture, and we're lighting the leaves, which are the fine fuels. The leaves ignite uh, twigs, and and we want a low intensity fire here. This this is perfect, just uh, a low 
fire going downhill. Now, mind you, uh, this is a southeast wind, a west uh, aspect. Uh, so the, the smoke's actually burning, or I'm sorry, blowing uphill at this point. So you can see the, the issues with that. A lot of smoke management in there. Again, what's that smoke gonna do when it leaves? So before we can do a burn, we have to look at a at fire weather that's gonna tell us uh, how high that smoke's gonna go with the transport wind, where the direction is gonna take it, how quickly it's gonna get up there and disperse. Um, so we got some good flame length there. Uh, we've got a crew that's lighting and a crew that's holding and, and I'm holding here. I'm just keeping stuff, any of the, the burned out embers, bring them back in away from the, the edge of the line so that we don't get a wind that picks up and carries something across the line. I say so. Uh, the fire break was actually built above the shelter woods. You're looking through a set of undisturbed forests down to that line of really young forest where the shelter wood actually is. So it's just now getting down into the woods where the, it needed to be. But yeah, that was just due to just the, the fire line. Correct. So we used an existing fire line that was in there. Uh, it, it just made sense to do that. So yeah, and, and as you get in there, you can see we got some pretty good flame there. You can see some leaves blowing again, the fire going back to that fire triangle that the wind is the unknown and the fire is going to generate its own uh, wind energy there. Uh, very smoky. We we had quite a bit of smoke in the valley and, and it hung on until uh, late. Uh, you know that throughout the night uh, we did stay over through the night and and checked it after dark you can really see the embers then again it's just just a being cautious to make sure about ready to tie into the road and it'll suck in if you watch the smoke is going to start all the smoke is heading that direction yeah so so again that that's what that's what uh fires do they 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 can run control themselves if we don't have them managed properly not a good bit of smoke there mm -hmm. down the road and saw a truck for sale yeah and where's that smoke going to go again smoke management is critical uh i think the the take home is don't try this without a professional uh, don't go out don't and drop a match because <laughs> it, it is a recipe for disaster if you know you don't have the the tools and and the personnel that know what they're doing to uh, to be able to manage this properly. It, it's just a recipe for disaster, and we want to be able to keep fire as a management tool. And as long as we do it uh, properly and and within the guidelines, I think we can keep that management tool. That should be about it. I apologize. I got the slides a little bit. Fast out of order, forward so. uh, photos of the of the morning after, shall we say? Um, and Tim can comment on so, that. So this is mop up. Uh, we left the site. This was a very narrow site, so we did not leave any smoke in there. I live two hours away, uh, so so to I can't go back and check it regularly. So we the next day made sure that we had every bit of smoke uh, gone. We poured water on the, the burning uh, branches and stumps, made sure again that we had everything done. Uh, what's, we got a couple slides there of some of the burn areas. This is generally what it looked like afterwards. Um, the next slide shows, I'm sorry, the one after. Yeah, so, so here we can see uh, some of the, the, the damage, the tree on the right probably is not going to be harmed. Uh, the tree on, or I'm sorry, on the right, the tree on the left is probably not going to be harmed. Tree on the right certainly is. What you need to remember in the difference between trees and grasses and forbs, trees have their growing points above the soil surface. So if you blacken that, and, and the, the next slide really shows that uh, that, that tree is pretty much gone as far as the, the above the soil surface. It may, it may sprout again. Is that the, uh, Tim, as I recall you explaining the next morning, um, the white, uh, the, the, what happens is the cambium uh, fries and then it breaks the uh, bark, right? Yeah, so we get it hot enough that, that any moisture in there is just gonna heat up and, and that's what caused that bark separation there. 
Uh, and that's, that's a great nice sucker sprout. You will, will, you know, it's one of those things you're going to have to watch, but it's certainly not going to do anything as far as uh, the the top growth anymore. Right. This would be a beech that uh, is one of the target trees for the prescribed burn. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. We have any slides? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, let me go in on because uh, I've been watching the questions that have come in. Uh, yeah. The cost. Um, it isn't cheap. It's a significant <laughs> investment. Um, I think it was about four hundred dollars per acre. Um, exclusive, and this is the variable that will vary from site to site, exclusive of the need uh, and cost to prepare adequate fire breaks, which will vary. I mean, we had a road that we could use for one. We had to do one above it. We had a pasture on the other side that we, all we had to do there was uh, bush hog it to create a fire break. Um, the uh, uh, equip uh, items, I think were designed for how they, when they do it down the south, uh, where you have a flat area and you have pine trees and it is uh, woefully inadequate. Um, and I know that Stephanie Downs uh, is, is making an effort to try to get those ratcheted up where it's reasonable. It's probably about, uh, you know, 10 or 11% of what the actual cost was. Um, so it's really not economically feasible unless um, N NRCS can um, adjust the pay items to something where it actually is a cost share as opposed to 100% almost landowner cost. I don't know, Stephanie, or I don't wanna put you on the spot, but any, any update on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, right now is currently the time of year when NRCS looks at what they pay for different practices and makes adjustments as needed, but it's a regional decision. So Ohio's currently putting in our justification for why we think we need to increase that reimbursement rate for prescribed fire, and then it gets debated at the regional level, and any changes will be put in place for 2022. Make sure I get my years correct. So we're working on it, but it's a slow process. Can you see the uh, questions, Jim? Do we want to answer, work our way through those? Uh, yeah, I, I see one, one right. from Mike. Uh, Tim, if you could, interested in your background and how you got into this, uh, uh, you like to light fires when you were a little kid. Is that how it started? Or This, this was my first fire. Uh, no, just <laughs> kidding. Uh, yeah, I, I've been burning uh, over 40 years as a natural resources manager. Uh, I burned with uh, U.S. Forest Service in Michigan a little bit, uh, burned with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service up along Lake Erie, burned for Ohio Division of uh, Wildlife and Forestry, for private folks over 40 years uh, um, in natural resources management. My crew actually, uh, guys, the two guys that you saw there, they each have over 30 years experience. And so we go through training. Um, we, we go through a, a basic fire fire training. Uh, we go through prescribed fire management training and, and take updates. So uh, it, again, it, it's something that, that you learn. There are a lot of formulas you're going to learn, but I think the, the bigger issue is that what, what we have learned through the years, we look at each fire and, and we learn a little more from there. So uh, yeah, we, we've got some, some time in there. That doesn't mean that we know everything by any means, but uh, you know, we, we know enough to be safe about it. Yeah, so uh, looking at some of the other questions, um, plan on doing it again. Uh, it is recommended to try to do it uh, at least one more, maybe a few more times. Um, that depends on how successful Stephanie is. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, the optimal time to do it, um, Alex, as I understand, is anywhere between the three to eight year range. Um, and uh, it, it sort of depends. Uh, and then uh, I think the, yeah. As far as the initial burn anyway, yeah, the three to, three to seven is what I'm familiar with. Yeah, then it and would- Tim, I understand there's a whole lot of difference on whether you do it in the spring or the fall. And I do, it'd be great to be able to do it in the summer, but the heat factors probably uh, foreclose it. Could you Correct, the growing season burn is what, what you wanna do. Uh, it just depends on the fuel there. 
uh, with the uh, with with the poplar and maple, those leaves break down much more quickly than, as Dave mentioned, with the oak. So that that's managing the fuel is going to be the biggest issue that that we deal with, and as we go forward. Yeah, and I know that in our instance, uh, uh, Tim, uh, uh, I started bugging you in August about doing this in the fall, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, then I bugged you again in September and, you know, <laughs> every other week, how's it going, Tim, you know? Uh, and, and the factor for us, I know that, that pushed it into early November was we were waiting for enough um, leaves to, to fall and to dry out so that we had sufficient fuel. It wasn't an issue of not having, it was, the, the problem was a, a deficit of fuel, not a too much fuel, right? Correct. And so we, we saw the, the and, and we're seeing the frost date move back uh, every year. And so as, as it gets a little later, it's going to take us later into the season. Uh, that's going to that's going to limit our burns, uh, our spring burns because of spring green up are really limited. So we have a very narrow window to work with there as far as um, burning goes. And uh, again, being two hours away, I uh, the last trip I think I made, I, I looked at closely at, at your side and then compare it with my woods and kind of monitored. And, and one of the crew is from that part of the state. So he helped me monitor. Uh, and, and we came up with, I think we were to try to burn the day before. Uh, the weather wasn't as good as it was the day we did burn. And so that's one of the things that we do. We make plans and everything's good to go. And then the morning of, if the weather's not there, we're just going to cancel and start all over again. Well, I think uh, it's 10.30, Dave, so... Uh, We've got some more questions if we have time. Okay. I, I think we're, we got till 10.35. Oh, okay. So I've got a question from Julie. What is the smallest acreage that could benefit from a prescribed burn in a manageable way? They've got a 10 to 20 acre tree farm. I'd say Tim could take that one. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I'm going to suggest you work with your um, work, work with your certified forester and let them make the determination as to whether it's something that would uh, benefit you. And if they determine that, then certainly uh, get a hold of a prescribed fire manager and uh, see it, see if the process is is worth pursuing. Hey Tim, could you uh, talk about licensure and uh, requirements? That we had a question about that. Okay, so we, we put in for an EPA permit. I guess anymore it's, a, it's an EPA notification. We notify uh, Environmental Protection Agency that we're going to burn. What this means is that we have looked at all the surrounding uh, landowners. We've notified those landowners. Uh, we made sure we're not too close to any uh, um, buildings. And then we the Division of Forestry, we're in a burn ban right now. The Division of Forestry gives us a permit if we're a certified prescribed fire manager, will give us permit to uh, allow us to burn during that restricted time. Um, this all takes time. Uh, you've got, depending on the time of the year, I, I tell folks to plan on three or four weeks. It, it may not take that much time, but but I like to, to let them know that we've got that kind of time frame. So it's not something we can start today and burn in a couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, a lot of things that we have to look at when we're putting together that whole uh, um, permit. Okay, I think we're getting close on these. Someone asked about the same technique for a white pine stand and, and probably the answer is no. Um, I don't see a reason why you'd want to burn a white pine stand unless you're really have some oak regeneration or something else in there. So I'd be careful in that one and get some direct advice and have someone on site. Uh, CRP grassland, is it the same as a wooded area? So Tim, you wanna answer that one quickly? Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, they're, 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 they're just two different uh, beasts. We've got the, the fuels are different. Uh, the flame length is different. Uh, typically the objective is different in, in each of those. So uh, no, fire is used for both, but, but a lot of differences. And then the final one that I see is uh, some are using goats to lower the fuel loads. Um, and what are your thoughts on that? If the understory is out of hand. 
I think that, uh, I, I guess the only fuel load I could think of that, that in this case that goats would uh, be able to utilize would be stilt grass, something like that. I, I don't think, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to eat the leaves. Uh, I, I guess they will eat some of the green leaves and some of the twigs, but um, primarily I, I think the stilt grass, which, which, is, is an issue in a prescribed fire that will have to be addressed. Yeah, the goats could possibly be used, but again, you'd need expertise that we don't have necessarily as a way to control some of that competing vegetation, but it wouldn't be to reduce the fuel load would, would be my thought on that. All right, I know we're running up on the clock, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Tom. Thanks, Jim and Alex and Tim. Thanks and for having us. Yes, indeed, thank you. thank you all very much. This has been a great presentation. Uh, we're going to be taking a 10-minute break.